Hello, everyone. Welcome to this webinar on serving out-of-school youth for VR professionals, outreach, engagement, and support. My name is Jessica, and I'm a YTAC team member. So this webinar is being recorded. The webinar recording, PowerPoint, and transcript will be emailed to participants and will also be on our website uh, in a few days. Uh, the audio will be coming in through, through your computer, so you don't have to call in. Um, so before we begin, let's go over a few things. On the top right-hand corner, um, you'll be able to download our PowerPoint presentation at any time during the webinar. Right below that, you'll see a links pod, and you're going to see our um, participant evaluation. We'd greatly appreciate it if you could take about five minutes uh, to complete this, just so um, we are able to ensure that we're providing high-quality training and technical assistance. And below that, you'll see our Q&A box. Uh, feel free to ask your questions to our presenters, and we'll answer them right away. Um, and at the very bottom of the right-hand corner, feel free to participate in conversation with everyone else. You can introduce yourself if you'd like. Um, OK, so I believe that's it. I'm going to hand things over to Kim Osmani now. Thank you, Jessica, and welcome, everybody. We are so excited to have, um, right now we've got over 80 folks that are online with us right now for our second webinar in a three-part series, really talking about um, Title I and Title IV of the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act, partnership possibilities um, to benefit youth with disabilities. And we are so excited. I was excited to see that um, uh, like over 60% of you were on yesterday's webinar, the first part. And so we're really excited to have you back and those of you who are joining us for the first time today. So today we're going to focus on the second part of the curriculum guide. And it focuses on serving out-of-school youth for VR professionals, really looking at outreach, engagement, and support. We have um, a few presenters with us today, a couple from the National Youth Employment Coalition, Thomas Showalter and Kate Sullivan, who will join us here shortly and tell us um, or share some information with us, as well as Charlotte Barnett, who is from the Arizona Center for Youth Resources, who is going to give us a real-life example of a partnership in place that is benefiting, benefiting youth with disabilities. And I am Kim Osmani. I am one of the technical assistance liaisons with the Voc Rehab Techni Youth Technical Assistance Center, or as we refer to it as YPAC. At the conclusion of the webinar, there will be a link that pops up in the chat box, as well as there's going to be a link on the slide for you to complete the evaluation of today's webinar. And we greatly value the feedback that we can get from all participants, not only on the structure and success of the, the actual webinar itself, but the content and how you're going to use information and what we can do to better support you. We also hope that possibly through this webinar, you, as a, if you're working for a state VR system um, or a partner system and want more information, possibly some technical assistance from our Technical Assistance Center, we would love to hear from you. And you'll have contact information as well. We have put in process to get CRC um, approval. Uh, nothing is finalized yet, but we do want you to know it is in the process. And what's really important is that at the end of the webinar, you will have to complete the evaluation, but you'll also need to um, email Jessica Fuentes Diaz, who opened up this webinar, um, and keep in touch with her until the process has been finalized. So please, if it is something that you are seeking to get the CRC credits, which we we know how important those are, and we're really trying hard to get those for you, that you touch base with Jessica. So a little bit about YPAC. Um, we are one of, one of several national technical assistance centers focusing on helping youth and or students with disabilities um, achieve competitive integrated employment. And the um, grant is held and led by the Institute for Educational Leadership in Washington, D.C through their Center for Workforce Development. And there are several partners that come together to make YPAC what it is and for us to be able to accomplish the work that we do. One is a contract with Cornell University's Lisa Yang and um, Hockey Tan Institute on Employment and Disability, which is in the School of Industrial and Labor Relations. Um, 
that's where we get some project um, directorship from, some evaluation components, and um, technical assistance liaison. We also partner with Boston University School of Education, who helps us evaluate the programs and services that we are doing um, in collaboration with our state bureau agencies, as well as the many subject matter uh, experts that um, come from all over the country to help us with our deliverables, to help us with technical assistance and training. Um, and so a, a lot of um, wheels in motion to make this baby fly. Um, IEL is in Washington, D.C. and really focuses a lot on um, helping youth, parents, and, and families come together and develop leadership skills um, to truly impact that ultimate outcome of um, involvement and engagement in the community and employment. So like I said before, we are um, um, charged with providing technical assistance and training to state voc rehab agencies to help them find and engage youth with disabilities who aren't in special education. So those might be um, students with disabilities who are in school but not on an IEP and possibly not even on a 504 plan, as well as those that are out of school um, and not employed, not engaged in post-secondary education. Um, so that is our population. We talk a lot about working with opportunity youth, such as um, individuals who might be um, involved in the juvenile justice system or in foster care or be a person um, with a disability who dropped out or, or who's a teen parent or a pregnant teen. teen. So we look at all of these populations and how we can really help state their agencies um, find these youth engage with these youth and help support them in achieving competitive integrated employment. There are four other centers that help support youth, and as I mentioned before, um, one of that is um, one of them is WinTAC, which is out of San Diego State University. They're the Workforce Innovation and Technical Assistance Center, providing TA around some real key areas in WIOA. Everybody's heard of the pre-employment transition services. That's one in their wheelhouse, as well as um, the subminimum wage and some other areas. Then we have NTACT, which is the National Technical Assistance Center on Transition, who works more on the education side of things, and many of you um, will remember them as NSTAC. Um, we also have the Promise TA Center that works a lot with um, families and um, students and youth who are receiving um, supplemental security income. Uh, and as I mentioned already, the National Collaborative on um, Workforce and Disability out of the Institute for Educational Leadership. So we've got several national centers that are helping support um, agencies in serving these populations. So now I am I'm glad to turn it over for the beginning of the content of our webinar today um, on serving out-of-school youth for VR professionals. And I would like to introduce Thomas Schulwalter and Kate O'Sullivan, who are from the National Youth Employment Coalition. So Thomas and Kate, I'm turning it over to you. Hi everybody, this is Thomas Showalter. Uh, as Kim mentioned, I'm the Executive Director of the National Youth Employment Coalition. Uh, this is a really exciting partnership for us. Um, uh, we've been working with uh, uh, YTAC for almost two years now. Um, and uh, uh, I should say I'm great, uh, also uh, very appreciative of, of Jessica Fuentes Diaz at, uh, at IEL for making this uh, so seamless. It takes a lot of work to make these uh, webinars look uh, look as, as easy as she makes it. So um, she's doing a great job as well. Um, uh, so we're really glad to be part of this technical center, technical assistance center. I think it's great that there is a technical assistance center focusing on uh, out of school youth with disabilities. Um, and it's a, a really place to NYC sweet spot as a uh, national network of organizations that think a lot about out of school um, youth and uh, try to lift up best practices from around the country. Um, and we're uh, pleased to be co-presenting today with uh, Charlotte and ACYR, a uh, longtime uh, NYEC member. Um, you know, we also uh, are a, a kind of aggregator of practices uh, across the field at, um, of youth employment and about all kinds of different subpopulations, justice-involved youth, undocumented youth. Um, so I'd uh, encourage you to visit our website and learn more about us. We also have a uh, convening coming up. I'll put the uh, uh, direct link to the registration in the chat box um, in May uh, on uh, a range of uh, issues related to um, 
uh, Opportunity Youth, and that will also include a uh, day-long uh, learning lab um, run by our colleagues at YTAC. So you can come back and uh, engage more in person uh, uh, at our convening uh, May uh, 30th and 31st. So hope to see some of you there. And I believe that uh, Kate is going to uh, take over for the next couple slides. Thanks, Thomas. Um, hi, I'm Kate O'Sullivan, and delighted to be with you all here this afternoon. Um, and just going to talk a little bit about a publication um, that a lot of this um, information that we're sharing is coming out of. Um, as YTAC has worked with state VR agencies around the country, um, they found there is a real strong in interest um, among VR professionals in learning more about how to partner with the workforce system. And um, as you probably know, VR is authorized under Title IV of WIOA, or the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act. And um, WIOA also authorizes under Title I the workforce system. Um, even though VR and workforce are in the same federal law, um, they, you know, they still tended to stay in their lanes, which of course is very common in, in most systems. Um, WIOA has encouraged greater partnership, and VR professionals want to know more about how to do that. So YTAC asked NYC to develop a guide that would help VR professionals understand the Title I system and understand more about how they might partner with Title I with the workforce system. NYC also was asked to capture some of the best strategies for working with what Title I calls out-of-school youth, which of course is what we're focusing on for this webinar. Um, many youth with disabilities will qualify automatically as out-of-school youth under Title I, and Thomas is going to discuss this more in a minute. Um, this offers real potential um, for partnering to leverage resources and services for this population of young people that you all work with in VR and that folks in workforce work with. To develop this guide, which um, we're anticipating releasing in the next couple of months, we're excited about it, um, we interviewed over 20 VR and workforce professionals all over the country um, in small, medium, and large states um, to get their insights on what type of partnering is already happening between VR and workforce and what was working for different populations of young adults that they were working with. All of you who registered for this webinar um, will receive a notice when the guide is available. In the meantime, we are working with YTAC to um, host this webinar, webinar series um, to highlight some of the les lessons that are captured in the guide. Today is our second webinar. Um, we're very happy you joined us. And um, also at the beginning um, uh, of our webinar, I saw that quite a few of, uh, of you joined us yesterday as well. So thank you for taking another hour out to be with us. Um, yesterday was our first webinar, and we um, looked at basics at intersections between the workforce system and the VR system. And we learned about a partnership in Minnesota where the VR agency and the workforce system in Northeast Minnesota have forged a connection to implement programming for VR youth. Um, it was a really good presentation. And if you'd like to listen to that or just to check out the resources, um, you'll see that there's a link to the YTAC website um, under the last bullet on the slide. And you're welcome to check that out. Our next and last webinar in the series will be on April 1st, and it's going to focus on establishing interagency partnerships. We'll be learning about approaches from a state where the VR workforce and the juvenile justice agencies have all come together um, to partner to serve uh, youth with disabilities. So we're really looking forward to that and hope you'll be able to join us. Um, the link to register is in the second bullet up here on the slide. I'm going to turn it back over to Thomas now to talk a bit more about out-of-school youth and the overlaps between workforce and VR. OK, thanks, Kate. Uh, yeah, I'm going to start um, at kind of a, a high level, uh, since today we're really talking about serving out-of-school youth um, with uh, just noting that the out-of-school youth population in the United States is very large and diverse. Um, uh, we happen to, on this webinar, we're saying out-of-school youth because, as uh, many of you know, in Title I of WIOA, uh, that's the, the defined term. Uh, in the youth employment field, we often say opportunity youth for young people who are out of school and out of work. Um, so in, you know, for the next uh, 45 minutes, uh, I guess I and I'll, I'll be using those, those uh, 
uh, term synonymously. Uh, the, the current estimate is that there are about 4.3 million um, opportunity youth between the ages of 16 and 24 in the United States. Uh, this is a, a very large and, and diverse population, um, and you see great variance across the country in rates of youth disconnection. Uh, rural areas tend to be uh, somewhat higher. Uh, sometimes those rates are even over 20% of young people are disconnected. Um, uh, there also tends to be higher rates of disconnection in the southeast. Um, uh, we tend to see uh, relatively lower rates of, of disconnection in uh, suburban areas, but it's really pretty pretty consistently uh, high around the country. Um, and I think one point that's that's worth noting here is that a lot of these young people are uh, people with uh, disabilities either diagnosed or, or undiagnosed who may not be getting the services that they need and uh, this is a, a, a really powerful uh, population for um, uh, VR counselors to be to be reaching um, you know so we do want to note that you know there's a lot of uh, reasons just within the workforce system for uh, for voc rehab agencies to partner with we owe a title one agencies in the title one system um, uh, under WIOA, the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act, which was passed in 2014, Title I, 75% uh, of Title I youth services dollars are now supposed to be spent on these out-of-school youth. Um, so that's a, a pretty significant change from the previous uh, iteration of the law and has resulted in a, a significant amount of interest in this population by uh, Title I providers. Uh, these out-of-school youth, from a VR perspective, um, uh, are, uh, if they have a disability, are often eligible for uh, uh, services under, under VR. Um, uh, another, um, you know, point that, uh, that we want to note is that uh, from the Title I perspective, um, almost all uh, youth with disabilities are eligible for Title I services. Um, they, uh, if you're an out-of-school youth with a disability, you're automatically eligible for Title I. And if you're an in-school youth with a disability, uh, you, only your personal income, not your family income, is considered in the low-income test for uh, Title I services. So uh, almost all uh, youth with disabilities qualify. Um, uh, so you know, an another, uh, another element of WIOA that will hopefully help these uh, two systems talk to each other better are the common measures that uh, uh, WIOA instituted for uh, most of the major programs in WIOA. So WIOA youth and VR now share a lot of similar uh, outcome measures. We're not going to, there's going to be a lot more information about this overlap in the curriculum guide. Um, we're not going to talk about it today because uh, we want to get to uh, uh, hearing more about the, the great work that Charlotte's doing. Um, uh, but I'll just note that those uh, there's a lot of that opens up a lot of doors for co-enrolling uh, and uh, alignment across those systems. Um, so here's how we're going to we're not going to go through kind of what our uh, this uh, meta analysis of research that we did uh, for this curriculum guide on the webinar today. Um, we're kind of just going to introduce the idea, the framework that we came up with for uh, how to talk about out-of-school youth. So um, we reviewed research going back to 1987 um, about serving uh, young people with barriers to employment and basically came up with this uh, relatively simple framework that you see here um, that, talk about, that talks about recruitment, preparation, engagement, ongoing support. Um, you're also going to see uh, when, when in, in how Charlotte talks about uh, some of the things that she's doing, you'll see some of those kind of elements reflected. We're not saying that this is the only way to think about how to uh, serve opportunity out of school youth or opportunity youth, but this is, um, you know, these are some common kinds of activities that you see across uh, programs um, that are serving out of school youth and, and their research basis for serving out of school youth. Um, so that's that's going to be a and in in the curriculum guide that'll be coming out. There's going to be a lot of uh, we have a, a wide range of evidence-based practices under each of these buckets um, that you'll be able to learn more about. So they'll so you know definitely check your email inboxes for that uh, when the curriculum guide gets released. Um, and with that, I believe uh, ready to turn it over to uh, Charlotte. Uh, Charlotte, take it away. 
Thomas. Um, <clears throat> I'm really excited to uh, be a part of this webinar today. Um, ACYR has been in the community here in Phoenix for about uh, 43 years. Um, and our goal is to help young people with their education, um, gain skills, and uh, the ability to uh, enter into meaningful employment opportunities. Um, so uh, we do that in multiples of different ways. And I thought I would start with a great example of a uh, young person in action. Um, and So I want to talk a little bit about uh, one of our great career pathway programs here uh, that we have implemented at ACYR. Um, it is our ACYR field school program. It is a great collaboration with the Bureau of Land Management and the City of Phoenix WIOA uh, funded programs and, um, and a conservation uh, group uh, that is uh, employed by the Bureau of Land Management. Um, these young people are doing really great, wonderful things out on public lands, um, and it is a complete matching of education, uh, hands-on learning um, that lead directly to employment opportunities. Um, and you can see that they earn enough hours through this experience that they can get non-competitive employment opportunities with the government. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about Jeremiah. Jeremiah is pictured here um, on your screen. He's the young man on the right um, with the stick in his hand. Um, Jeremiah was uh, diagnosed with a couple of mental health disorders, bipolar, depression, anxiety. Uh, he was seeing a psychiatrist on a regular basis and taking uh, two different medications daily. Before he was accepted into the field school program, uh, his advisor wanted to make sure uh, that this really was going to be an appropriate opportunity for him. Um, so she spoke with his psychiatrist, who wrote a statement saying she felt he was emotionally stable enough to participate in the program. So given the unique nature um, of what we were doing with our field school program, uh, the Bureau of Land Management also wanted to make sure that uh, he would be able to participate out in the backcountry uh, for days. Um, they, they really do go out into the field and spend multiple days uh, camping, uh, creating trails, uh, doing conservation work um, in, in those areas, uh, but they will be gone for days at a time. So uh, Jeremiah was meeting with a psychiatrist uh, every other week as well as with his career advisor weekly to, to check in to make sure that everything was going well. Uh, his crew leader was also aware of the situation and played a huge role in helping with Jeremiah's success. Um, so we saw this as a really great opportunity to ensure we put multiple supports in place for Jeremiah. Um, and it was successful. It, was, it ended up being the perfect environment for him. He thrived. Uh, and he was able to graduate the program successfully. Um, he enjoyed conservation to such a degree that he's actually moved to Flagstaff, Arizona to be closer to the mountains and currently ha is on a paid internship with the American Conservation Experience um, where he's working to repair trails uh, and hopes to lead his own crew at some point um, and now has no plans to move back to a city, <laughs> to a large city of Phoenix. Um, so a really great, wonderful success story of a young man who was able to take on a, an opportunity uh, in, in our workforce programming. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about our structure. Um, ACYR has put together what we call a pathway uh, to success. Um, and I'm going to actually show you what that looks like. One second. I may have some technical difficulties. I apologize. Jessica, it doesn't seem like I can move the share screen over. Perfect. Thank you.
So at ACYR, um, our pathways to success we see as a 360 degree approach to serving our young people. Um, and it's really designed as a menu um, that youth can choose from based upon their goals. Um, so they can attend any of our programs and services or we have partners in the community that we can refer them to based on what their specific needs are. Um, so you can see from uh, this, this flow chart, um, we, we start with looking at our staff. We, we really look at how are they prepared uh, to connect our young people uh, to the opportunities. Um, and that is a continuous thing we do throughout everything uh, that we're doing with building programs, looking at our services, uh, and uh, providing those opportunities to our young people. Um, when we're looking at recruitment um, or engagement, as we like to term it, um, is how are we finding these young people? You know, we're out on the streets canvassing, uh, looking for hot spots that young people hang out at. Um, you know, we find young people uh, of a similar age that have come from that similar background as a as perfect individuals to be out there doing street outreach. Um, our community-based partnerships, education partners, uh, community workshops are available on campus uh, free of charge um, to anyone who would like to take advantage of those. And then we offer regular information sessions uh, throughout the week. So uh, if somebody is interested in learning more, um, they have that direct link as well. So really looking at multiple approach to how do we engage with our young people in the community. Um, and one additional thing that we do that I forgot to mention is social media and paid marketing and advertising um, within that. Um, and uh, that does seem to have some success as well. Um, and we're getting ready to actually move into Snapchat. So stay tuned, and I can let you know how that one works out. Um, but so far, we've used uh, Twitter um, and Facebook, and, and those definitely bring in some results of young people. Um, so our next step in our process is our uh, readiness assessment. Um, and for those of you in the re-engagement world as well, this, this really kind of speaks to how are we doing our best job of matching the young people to the services that are most appropriate to them. Um, we don't want to set them up for failure. And so we're always looking at, are they ready? You know, are they socially and emotionally ready? Do they need some sort of additional support uh, and basic needs uh, resolution before they can be really successful in whatever it is that we are going to help them uh, participate in? Um, and uh, so most of our young people, uh, once they're assessed, they move into ACYR 101. Um, we don't typically see a huge need to um, just refer them to a partner program for interventions um, before they're ready to move on to the next step. Usually we're able to do things concurrently um, as they're moving through uh, the different uh, layers. Um, so a young person that moves into what we deem as ACYR 101, we are really looking at a heavy assessment of their uh, academic skills, any barriers or needs. Um, uh, career skills, uh, you know, and, you know, not officially going through like an ACEs uh, assessment, but right. kind of keeping that in go. the back of our head as we're working with the young people. Um, and then Charlotte, sorry, the before you go on, we do have a, a question from one of the yeah. participants. Um, Kim is asking, what is leave no race trainer? Oh, Leave No Trace, uh, it's a certification that's available in the conservation um, uh, program that uh, helps them learn how to leave no traces with Sorry. I can Hi, hear Scarlett. You. Yeah, we can hear you. Oh, okay. Yes. Um, so I'm sorry. Did everybody hear about the Leave No Trace trainer information I was saying, or do I, should I start over? Uh, 
Uh, this is go ahead Kim. and start over just in case. Yeah, go ahead and repeat it. Okay. Sure, no problem. So the, the leave no trace, it, I see now it, there's a typo. It's not race. I apologize. It should be no trace. Leave no trace trainer is a certification that's offered uh, through the conservation partner uh, that helps the young people learn how to um, uh, leave no trace when they're out in the wilderness. So it's, it's like a pack it in, pack it out kind of uh, mentality. Um, really, how do they do a good job of not leaving any sort of fingerprint while they're out there to leave things undisturbed um, and as they found it? Okay, so back to where we were with uh, the 101. So the culmination of the ACY 101 is our College and Career Blueprint. Um, and I'll pull that up really quick so we can talk about that. Um, the College and Career Blueprint um, is an um, it's, it's a document that was designed in collaboration with the City of Phoenix WIOA program to meet the requirements of the um, uh, to meet the requirements of the uh, individualized service strategy that was written into the legislation, um, and we also designed it so that it spoke to uh, the requirements of the ECAP here in Arizona, which is the, edu uh, the education uh, career plans that they have to be developed. Um, and so ACYR actually put together an activity that goes along with this. So what you're seeing on your screen is the activity that helps us get to filling in these different quadrants um, and that we'll go into a little bit more about as we go through. Um, and it's, it's really a facilitative process to get the young people learning from each other um, as well as their facilitator to really talk through things. Um, I always used to say when I facilitated it with the young people that it was the, the, it was the one uh, acceptable place to steal. Um, stealing ideas is always good, so I always used to encourage them to listen to each other and if they heard something that made sense for their own plan, to make sure they included it. Um, so we really have that facilitator illustrating some of their own personal circumstances, uh, giving the young people some time to complete the different sections with them, um, and then also giving them some time to um, uh, to talk with each other as well and share what they're putting down on the papers and ask questions. Um, so you can see here each uh, the, the youth would be grouped with a partner so they can discuss because the most important piece of this is really that they're learning from this experience, not just that they can put some words down on a paper. Um, and so once that's done, then we ask them to debrief as a full group. Uh, this way, everybody learns from everybody else in the room. You know, uh, what, what is the goal they shared? Um, did they hear anything that they wanted to incorporate into their own plan? What excites them? What worries them? Uh, what are the benefits of reaching their goals, and is there anything missing um, that they didn't put down that they now would like to put down um, based on hearing everybody uh, and their share. So the actual College and Career Blueprint has a section that talks about their personal vision, um, which we have them pull from uh, Part A. It talks about their education and career goals. Um, it talks about the activities that will help them to achieve their goals, uh, what support service needs they would have, their job skills and career interests. And then a really key section is who are their champions? Like who are the people that are going to help them meet their goals? Uh, we also specifically ask the question is who is the one person you will always talk to? So uh, we get an idea of an individual that may be able to help track them down if they ever go missing. Um, from services. Um, and then there's an affirmation. We want them to actually say, how will they achieve their career goals? I will do this because. What's really motivating them uh, to reach those goals? So you can see in the different quadrants. Oh, yes. 
Michelle has a question on some of the information that you had just spoken about. She'd like to know how ACYR actually assesses the academic abilities. Um, she says that they have been told they have to do the TABE testing, which is the test of adult basic education for all youth, but that is a barrier to those with disabilities, a history of school difficulty, and it takes too long. How are you all assessing academic abilities? So unfortunately, we are also constrained um, by that within our WIOA funding. So it is a local requirement as well that we have to use the, the TABE as our assessment for academic skills. Um, but we also have other avenues. So if, if that is not an appropriate avenue, we, we don't necessarily have to put them through, um, through that because we do have our charter high school, uh, so they, they wouldn't have to. Um, we could just put them directly into other services um, and skip that step. Mm -hmm. So we do ask them what's standing in their way, how can they overcome it, obstacles, challenges, support needs. Um, we, these are some of the activities that we do uh, that they can look back on. Um, where they see themselves in five years, educationally, career, and personal. Um, again, we relate it back to uh, assessments that we've done with them um, so that they have information to pull from. Um, I'm going to go down. So then we talk about their current reality, like what's really, uh, what's really going on? You know, uh, what are their training needs? Um, where are they now? Like, what's really happening today? And then what are their strengths and interests, you know, with job skills and career interests? And I always have them dive a little deeper because it does seem like these are the areas that uh, they have the hardest time speaking to. So I do offer a lot of um, examples. Um, and it's even better if you know somebody that's in there that you could actually um, play off of a little bit so uh, to, to help that be a little bit more of a conversation. Um, the last step is then to talk about how are they going to get there. Um, and so we've done activities on how, how you can set goals, what are goals, uh, those types of things. And everything is designed just to help them reach that end point. Um, and then this is the piece where uh, we capture the education and career goals, just so you can see visually what that looks like. And we do have them break that up into short and long-term goals um, so that it's not so overwhelming. Um, a lot of times we end up going straight to these long-term goals and, and talking about, you know, what do you want to do for the rest of your life? And, uh, you know, I, I always like to say I didn't know what I wanted to do for the rest of my life at age of 18. Um, even 20 necessarily, so um, having that expectation with these young people is probably unrealistic. So how do we break that up for them to make it a little bit easier uh, to, to swallow for them? Um, and then you can see how they, would, um, how they would record the activities that would help them achieve their goals. Um, and that's just a blank copy of that document. All right, so I'm going to switch back to the, um, to the Pathways to Success flowchart for a second, um, just to point out how uh, the rest of uh, the services are, are kind of embedded into what we do. Um, we see the education components, and we either offer or we have access to all of the services listed under educational activities. Um, the same thing with the work, workforce activities. While being a WIOA provider, um, we have access to uh, most of those, but we also have the partnerships with the other providers as well. Um, we are also ha uh, have the youth development activities available uh, so that we can offer them um, there's an MSW on staff and interns from ASU that can work with young people if they need um, some sort of additional coaching, uh, counseling of a sort, um, and really help those young people overcome um, some of their barriers that they're experiencing to being more successful, as well as the regular coaching activities that their career advisors um, provide to them. Um, you know, 
and making sure that along the way we're celebrating and cheerleading with them so that it's not just about um, just meeting the goals, but really helping them uh, celebrate those wins. Charlotte, there's another question. Sure. They would like to know, how does this apply to individuals who lack personal insight or the ability to process abstract concepts or deficits with expressive and receptive communication skills? Well, that's a really uh, interesting question. Um, so ACYR is not equipped to handle any, any major disabilities. Um, we are not disability experts. Um, so what we would look at is if we found somebody had some very specific needs of that nature, we would reach out to our, our local VR partners um, or other partners in the community that specifically deal with youth with disabilities. Um, they are much more equipped to, to handle those very special needs. Um, that doesn't mean that we would turn them away from services. We would bring that partner in and make them a part of the plan so that we could make sure that we are providing the right accommodations as appropriate. Mm -hmm. um, some uh, additional special um, training that we offer is our Pathways programs. Um, we have a couple that are direct uh, employment opportunities, and then we do have our actual career pathway programming, very similar to our field school program. Uh, we see that putting young people into groups in their training um, is very successful. We've had about a 90% success rate of completion in our career pathway programs, um, with 86% of them uh, continuing their education or gaining employment. Um, so I think uh, specifically, and, and relating this back to youth with disabilities as well, uh, having them do things in those uh, group efforts really helps them to uh, create a peer network um, and, and navigate, uh, uh, navigate with each other. And I'm going to talk about that a little bit more here in a second. Um, so you can see what we're working towards is self-sufficiency within continued education and employment. Um, and I want to really point out that this college and career blueprint is not a one and done. It's something that is ongoing. Um, it's, it's a vital component in their goal setting and achievement. And we're continuously reviewing and evaluating um, the plan so that we can help the young people to be the most successful. Uh, and one key point that I, I like to, to make sure I point out is that you know, we shouldn't be afraid to steer them in a positive direction that's more conducive to their success. Obviously, we can't force our young people to do anything, but you know, I think once we have all the assessments and everything, um, it's, I've, I have found that it's not usually difficult to help steer them in the right direction um, if you can talk to them about why they'll be more successful. Um, and the ongoing coaching activities really are, are kind of that uh, cornerstone to really helping to continue them to be as successful as possible. Um, I, we make sure that we talk to our team about not assuming anything, uh, reaching out to family and friends is appropriate to pull them into the plan, um, asking open questions, um, and really trying to dig in to find out what's going on, um, you know, making sure that we understand why we're seeing some of the behaviors we're seeing from the young people, uh, especially you know our drop our dropout population. Um, they are used to not following through with things for multiple reasons. So how do we help them determine why they're not being successful? Um, really trying to guide them to having that conversation. All right, so I'm going to move back to the PowerPoint, and yep, thank you. And I'm um, going to talk a little bit more. Um, I talked about this college and career blueprint um, already. So I'm going to go ahead and move on. 
to effective practices. So we, we talked a little bit about cohort training and the activities. Um, and really just looking at how those peer networks help them to be more successful. Um, especially in Jeremiah's case, that was one uh, key ingredient for him was really having um, the, the rest of the young people that were in his group with him, supporting him, as well as the adults that were checking in with each other to make sure that they, they weren't doing anything that was in conflict with the plan. Um, you know, they really do start supporting each other's learning um, and even help them to navigate any of the issues they may have. Um, I can point out there was an entrepreneur training that we did uh, a couple of years back, and one of the young men in the group started having some issues coming to class and being on time. Uh, his advisor was actually struggling to get the young person to share what was happening. Um, his peers, though, did not have the same problem. Um, they were able to encourage him to be in class. They were able to help him share his problems. And eventually, one of his peers spoke to the advisor because of their concerns. Um, so the young man, while he didn't make a complete turnaround, uh, the team that was attached between the advisors, the teachers, the employers, and his fellow uh, uh, young people, they were able to make some accommodations to ensure that he could still successfully complete. Um, so I think, you know, while we're talking about youth with disabilities a lot of times, I think, you know, the, this out-of-school youth population uh, is very similar in, in, in needing to be coached uh, with how to be more successful, to navigating uh, through some of the barriers and issues they're experiencing and not just falling back on uh, what they know. Um, because we know that rest of the world is always going to be influencing their success, whether positively or negatively. Uh, so we have to help them figure out uh, how to best navigate that. Um, and so just, you know, thinking through a little bit with our out-of-school youth, you know, many of them have never been assessed for disabilities. Um, they've, they've flown under the radar, and uh, they do just enough a lot of times to skate by, or they drop out. Um, it gets too hard. They don't have the support. Uh, too many students in a classroom, and so they protect themselves the best way they can, and they figure it's better to just not be there. Um, and so then we see them uh, dropping out and not completing. Um, you know, and then what I've also noticed when working with a lot of the out-of-school youth, when uh, I look at their academic levels when they come in, um, you know, and other factors of, of the issues that they're experiencing, you know, it's hard to get them to admit that they may have a disability. Um, and since we can't assume anything, we still have to build an effective plan that helps set them up for success. Um, so looking at those low academic levels, looking at those learning styles, um, talking to them about their champions, uh, who do they talk to on even their worst day, who will always know how to get a hold of them, who's holding them accountable, you know, really working with them to identify who their support network is uh, can really help uh, to help you do a better job with helping them reach success. Charlotte, if you'll notice, we put up a um, poll question to find out from those that are on, what step do they find to be the most challenging in working with out-of-school youth? Is it finding the youth? Is it recruiting them, actually engaging them in services, or um, preparing them um, and helping them get employment or ongoing support? And so far, it looks like the majority um, are saying that the engagement piece, so they can find them, they can recruit them, but keeping them engaged seems to be the challenge. So thank you all for responding to that poll. Yeah, and I definitely think some of the things that I've talked about have been what I've seen as most successful with keeping those young people engaged. Um, I, I have found that me as the adult in their life is not necessarily what works best. Uh, so it really is pulling in all of the different components and helping to build that network around them uh, to that helps to keep them engaged a little bit better, and and really finding out what they're you know what they're there for and addressing that with them. Um, so I wanted to end this piece before moving on with an example for you. 
Um, it's actually a young man that I worked with uh, as, as a career advisor many years back uh, who when I got him on my caseload, he was already 21 years old um, and did have an IEP, so had already had that identified for him, but he'd been in ADE for two years by the time I, I was working with him. Um, and really hadn't had any updated IEP since he began um, our GED programming. Um, and so we kind of initiated that process because it was concerning for me that he had been in a classroom, had been there every single day, and it seemed no one had taken a moment to go, why is he still here? Is there something more going on? Um, and what we ended up finding out is that he had a low IQ and was not going to be successful in earning his GED. So luckily, because we went through that process, we were able to steer him into our high school, um, and he was actually able to successfully graduate um, within the time frame um, before he, uh, he aged out. Uh, so we were able to help, really help him navigate through that by uh, helping him regain credits um, while he was attending uh, the regular school day through uh, two semesters. Um, so I don't know that every story could end up being that successful because sometimes we catch them way too late. Um, but I do think really looking at that full picture is uh, going to help, uh, help them be the most successful. Um, so some more key uh, effective practices. Uh, you know, identifying who are your key partners. Um, you know, I think uh, this is a lot of times where a pain point can be, right? It is, uh, we spend a lot of time maintaining our partners, making sure everything's okay. Um, but what I find is that if you can identify who your partners are that are the most committed, that are willing to be at the table at a higher level, not, not just line staff, because I, I think that's really great that our, you know, uh, our line staff want to be engaged, but you know, how do we get to make this a deeper partnership? You know, and so what I've also seen is having that memorandum of understanding that outlines who's doing what, what are your common metrics that you're attempting to achieve, uh, really helps to elevate that partnership and uh, make it a priority on on all sides. Um, so I think for our young people that are more challenged, you know, those with disabilities or other life issues, having those committed partners at the table is, is paramount uh, to their success. It takes multiple caring adults working together to really make this happen for our young people. Um, so taking the time to determine the level of communication that's required for checking in and sharing information, who is taking the lead in the convening of the partners when it's needed, and who is the lead uh, in communication to pull it all together. Um, so even with all that, you know, it can still be painful, but if you make sure you have the right individuals uh, that are connected, it actually helps make or break this. So co-enrolling young people, um, you know, we all have outcomes that we have to satisfy. Uh, you know, whenever I sit at a table looking at how do we get young people working closely uh, with multiple organizations, what I typically find if I dig in is that our outcomes really aren't that different. It's just making sure we map them appropriately so we know what we're working towards and what are the time frames and timelines we need to adhere to. So. Additionally, how do we make sure we set appropriate goals so that we are making sure that all of those outcomes can be satisfied and that we're not putting anything conflicting into place for our young people? Um, when I've seen uh, partnerships fail when working with a young person that's co-enrolled is having multiple goals that are not set together puts the young person in such a conflict that they're trying to figure out what they're supposed to be doing. Um, so we've set it up for success from the very beginning. So again, going back to my previous slide, while that can be the most painful piece of it, it could also be more painful if you don't take the time to do it because you may not reach your goals because you missed a step. Um, so we really have to help our young people navigate 
the goals and services we're providing, um, as well as how we work with our partners to ensure that everything works in harmony. Um, you know, we also have to remember that our young people, especially the more vulnerable young people, uh, have a very hard time standing up for themselves and connecting the dots. So we always have to be cognizant of what's going on around them and remember to pull in the right people. The more caring individuals that are involved uh, really does make for better outcomes for our young people. So we want to make sure that we're eliminating duplication, map those services out, uh, find out who does what best, um, create that success plan, identify who's going to pay for what so that you don't uh, overlap um, or double dip on anything. Um, and then eliminate some of those usual challenges. You know, this is where that MOU I spoke about can come in handy. Agreeing in advance to what services each partner is responsible for, identifying common outcomes. Uh, so, and keeping in mind, we all serve the same or similar youth. No matter their background, issues, disabilities, or challenges, um, every youth needs us to help them navigate their success. They need those wraparound services to be successful. Um, and identifying what level of assistance they need early will, will help make or break this as well, right? Do they need their hands held? Uh, can they receive some coaching and try it on their own? You know, it's kind of hard sometimes to, to evaluate that, but we can't assume anything. We, we have to feel it out and we have to make a couple of attempts and then be ready to support them in a way that they need. Um, every young person has challenges to their success that we can help overcome. So. Um, so that's all I have for today. I think I can turn it back over to Kim. Charlotte, thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. This is amazing information. Um, great procedures and, and tools and things that you all have in place for serving youth through the um, ACYR program. Um, I want to, um, there were several questions that came up in the chat box, and what I'm going to recommend is that you all will, you all have Charlotte's contact information in the PowerPoint. And I know, Lacey, specifically, you had several um, questions for Charlotte. And if you could reach out to her to ask those, um, that would be awesome. But I do um, want to ask this one question that, that was uh, asked of a participant is, how do you train your staff to connect with the young adults? Charlotte. And this is actually something that we're focusing on currently. Um, to some degree, it's happened uh, a little organically, uh, passed down from the management of the organization without any sort of set curriculum, but always with a focus of positive youth development and practices in mind. Um, we also have access to uh, facilitation training that helps us look at how uh, we're delivering services to our young people, um, but the addition of the MSW on my team really is the step in the direction of codifying what a curriculum for uh, working with our, our staff will look like. Um, but always keeping in mind at this point, you know, trauma-informed care, uh, positive youth development practices, uh, how do we really help our staff look at how they're communicating with our young people um, and how they're delivering those services. So the content of our training has unfortunately been a lot heavier on the components of the processes and procedures um, with the uh, guidance and coaching from their managers and leads on how to interact with our young people. So we're looking at changing that because, as you heard me say in this, uh, in this presentation, it's, it is something that we do uh, consider to be the most valuable piece of the work with our young people. Wonderful. Thank you. And like I said, there are several other questions that specifically came from Lacey, so I'm, I'm recommending that she reach out to you because um, they're not necessarily programmatic. There's the other the data and stuff. Um, are there other questions that people want to ask of Charlotte or Kate or Thomas? One of the things that I did want to mention, um, in addition to the curriculum guide, and thank you, Kate, for the reminder, is that 
the YPAC also has a um, training set of training modules. There's eight of them that can um, be used by state VR agencies and their partners called the Youth Service Professionals Knowledge, Skills, and Abilities, and we refer to it as the YSPKSA, that we can come out and bring our um, trainers to train staff and partners in the area of um, kind of ramping up their, their service skills regarding youth. Um, so if you want information about that, you can certainly reach out and we can share that with you. I have pulled up this slide that has contact information. It's been up here for a little bit, but you can also download the PowerPoint slide. Um, before we move on, let's see, Jessica, can you pull that last polling question over, please, so we can get audience response on that? So the last question we wanted to ask our participants is, um, how much of a priority is developing partnerships to you, to your organization, um, to specifically serve out-of-school youth? Is it something, is it a top priority, you agree that it's a top priority for you, or somewhat agree, somewhat disagree, or disagree in terms of it being a high priority for you or your organization? And again, as you guys can see, as well as I can see, um, the overwhelming majority agree that um, developing those partnerships to get better access to, um, engage, and keep engaged uh, out of school youth is something we all have as a priority. So, that's why having this curriculum guide that, that we've developed in partnership with NYAC is so critical to being able to pull together the workforce um, folks with the Voc Rehab folks and other partners to see how we can really do this together. Um, and having examples that come like from Arizona today and Minnesota yesterday um, help all of us see it can be done. And I love the way Charlotte talked about, you know, kind of that wraparound approach. Um, it's, it's what is natural in, in supporting these youth with disabilities. Okay, Jessica, thank you. So, um, there we go. If you want inf more information about YTAC or any of the information from today, um, here is the email address for YTAC or the website. You can also follow us on social media. And you can go to our website and sign up for our newsletter. If you scroll all the way bottom to the right, you can enter your email address and access our quarterly electronic newsletter that does go out. Um, and most importantly, please don't forget to complete the webinar evaluation. And I believe that Jessica will also put the direct link into the chat box. She's been good about doing that. So we can get your feedback about today's webinar and um, future needs that you may have. So Jessica, if you can put that link there for them. And then um, lastly, I just want to remind everybody that we do have our final webinar um, in this series is coming up April 1st. And um, you can register for that on our website. I think Jessica's trying to find it on one of our opening slides so that you have the link. So there you go. Monday, April 1st uh, is our final webinar talking about the third part of the curriculum guide, which is on establishing the interagency partnership um, and specifically looking at frameworks and examples. And we have a director from one of the state VR agencies who's going to work with us that day and share um, some examples from his state. So we are very thankful to everybody who joined us today. And don't forget to download the materials and feel free to reach out to any of us for more information. And we hope you all have a wonderful day. And Charlotte, Kate, and Thomas, thank you all so much. We really appreciate your partnership. Thank you. This has been great. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you.